Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship as conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by TNK Hunting Gear. If you haven't heard about TNK, then it's about time you do. I've been using TNK gear out in the field and on hunts and have fallen in love with their stuff. TNK is veteran owned and 100% made in America using only American made products. All their gear is covered under a lifetime warranty with no questions asked. If it breaks or fails, they will fix it or replace it for free. TNK is your resource for bino harnesses, bow slings, and a lot more amazing gear. For more information about TNK hunting gear, go to tnkhunting.com. Dot com or search for them on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Freedom on and stay soulful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. And I am joined by a great friend of mine and just a solid dude and a fellow patriot, Chris Mann from High Range Hunting. And he's on, we're going to talk a little bit about his hunting season. He smoked his very first archery elk this year. And he is a former marine and with that also is a big proponent of uh helping veterans terminally ill and law enforcement get out and enjoying hunting in the wild and all that stuff so we're going to be diving into some of these topics chris man thank you so much for joining johnny mack my friend i we've we've been we've had this on the books well we tried it once when there was the bad audio yeah in june of last year so over a year ago we finally were able to make this happen again. Yeah, it's amazing how when you start off a podcast, you don't really know how things are going to play out and work. And then you're like, oh, that didn't sound as good as I <laughs> I hoped it would. So here I am rocking a headset now. Same with you. Me too. Um, yep. The games have been changed and we've upgraded. And so we're doing it. We're making it happen. Kind, kind of a big deal now. Yeah. We're, we're kind of important people in the world (laughs) well my children think i am at least so (laughs) perfect superman (laughs) right dad can you carry me up the stairs again dad come on you know it's just i'm a hero in their minds that's all that matters yeah dude so you're living uh that quasi college life Mm -hmm. here you are your former military you're on the uh what is it called the is it the The gi bill the gi bill over at wazoo trying to finish you got classes that haven't been offered because of COVID, but it's allowed you to get out and hunt a little bit more. A lot. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, pretty upset with the COVID shutdowns of school. Uh, it's been wonderful for me. Uh, <laughs> all, 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 all my classes are online, like virtually. So it's on Zoom. So all I have to do is wherever I'm at, as long as I have internet, log in, do the required stuff close my laptop or my cell phone and go back to hunting or you might lose the morning hunt depending on if you have to be in class but you always got that midday afternoon evening i scheduled i knew it was hunting season so i scheduled my earliest class is 11 o'clock perfect and only i only have classes on monday wednesday and friday so i have tuesday completely free and thursday completely free See, I love that. This, you know, and I'm always talking on this podcast about how life works out in your favor. And it's the the royal your. Like, you know, it life is happening for us, not to us. Here you are, you've been able to still get your education done, per, except for a couple classes or whatever. At the same time, you've been able to pursue your passion. You were able to take just a beautiful uh bowl. Was that in Idaho? Yeah, I was in Idaho. Yeah, that was a crazy. That was a crazy trip, dude. You've had a heck of a year. I have. I, it's been to date one of my best years, and I, really, it's just started. I, I haven't even scratched Washington off yet. Haven't even really entertained it for the most part. Uh, Idaho has been really good to me this year so far. Yeah, I am looking forward to hunting out of state for the very first time next year. You're I'm gonna not, love it. I'm not for sure exactly knowing what I'm going to hunt or where I'm going to hunt. But I am, after hunting spring bear here in the state of Washington, you and I, we drew the same tag for the same unit and all that. Um, Dude, if I can hunt year round, come on now. Come on. I mean, obviously, I'll chase coyotes till till the 
you know, sun goes down and even throughout the night and year round, but hunting big game animals, man, it really gets me going. Yeah, no, it's, you know, and I'm kind of bummed with, I didn't, I didn't invest as much time into that spring bear tag for Washington as I probably should have. Um, I had, I mean, but I had, you know, I had my barrel in Idaho that was just getting hammered. So it was like, well, I'm an hour and a half away from my barrel versus four and a half hours from the Washington unit. Um, but I mean, you, you, you took what two bears out of that same unit this year? (laughs) Two bears, same unit. Filthy. That's awesome. And, uh, same weekend. Like literally if you were to take where our tent was and draw a half mile circle around it, we in that same area, we, uh, saw seven bears within that little area. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you know, me and my brother, we, we made a trip up and we did the one day and saw some really fresh tracks and fresh sign. And then we realized, well, we still have a four and a half hour drive back <laughs> right. and, it, and it's getting, and it's getting dark and I don't really know this area too much. I mean, it was a lot of fun to explore it and I definitely will invest more time in it, but it was nice to get him out. My brother's not a hunter either. So he was just kind of there just to be there and exist, but you know, it was a good exercise for him, I guess. <laughs> oh man, that's so cool. Yeah, so we were able to we were able to film all of it and we got all nice. of this content that is gonna be coming out in twenty twenty one and Sweet. super jacked. It'll be on the YouTube channel, but we also are gonna be launching it on a different platform as well, which I haven't really talked too much about, but that's also why we haven't put out anything on the Washington Backcountry YouTube channel as of late, because we're we're banking it right now. Nice. Are you, uh, are you thinking about doing any like of the, like the full draw film tour submitting for that or Badlands or anything like the film fest? So our spring bear hunt, um, not it. So we, yes, we are submitting to the Badlands film festival this year. Sweet. Do uh, it. Definitely want to do full draw, but got to get an opportunity that makes it worth it. Um, last year we, Tony and I, my hunting partner for all you listeners out there, you'll, I'm sure you'll start to pick up on these names more often than not but tony and i we were gonna make a full draw film based off of an archery doe hunt which is something that is not very with within the film industry or like video like doesn't get people jacked but we had a cool story about it because everything yeah without getting into it needless to say when things work out we're gonna make it happen Perfect. I'm excited because, like, I remember. I think you, I think it was it that day you texted me, and it was just the picture of the paw, and I was like, oh. I think I was fishing too. I was at Lake Chelan fishing, and you texted me that, and I was like, dang it! Now I need to go. Oh, I need to go to this unit. Uh, Stupid! What am I doing fishing? Dude, I, I'll tell you. I love bear hunting. I think bear hunting. It, it might be my jam. It if it dude, it is. I think. Get your Idaho bear tag then. And come and do it with a bow out of out of a tree stand in a barrel. It's crazy. Dude, that sounds like a it's, lot of fun. Dude, it was super like, and I didn't even shoot like, I mean, I wasn't gonna be picky. Obviously, it was, you know, my first bear this year. But to see them and to realize how quiet they are, yeah. It was, I mean, it was insane. Like I looked up and there was a bear in front of me coming down the hill, and I, I'm pretty sure he saw me, but then he circled. And I was like, well, he might come back. And I look over and all of a sudden he's to my left. I was like, good Lord. They're just so quiet. It was incredible. <laughs> they're so quiet. So awesome. Uh, I actually, just like you, you shot your, your first bear with a bow this year, correct? Yeah. Yep. You, you had a heck of a year on your archery side. I was also going to go shoot my spring bear with a bow. But That's tough. it just so happened. And I, this bear, I, listeners have heard the story. I'll share it with you. Um, Tony shot and missed at a bear 15 minutes prior to me shooting by right. and so it, this bear was in a perfect location the terrain was super loud though so it would have been a tough stock but the wind was going uphill it was downhill for me i was i was good but because tony didn't have a bear down you know we didn't have blood down already i was like dude i really want to make sure we shoot something first before i just go chase after a bear all day with a with a bow rather than you know, still had his tag to think about. Yeah, for sure. Now, yeah, you, you guys, yeah, that's, it was so much fun seeing you guys, you know, just getting the tags. And then Tony ended up getting one too down, didn't he? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say that, like, 
so I mean, that was so much fun to see, especially because I mean, we all kind of we've kind of known each other for what, three years now, and yep. it's just kind of been that small. It's, it's, we all got into the see. game right about our, the same time. It seems like. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. And then I mean, it's fun to see things are you know learning has uh, occurred on all of our lives that things are finally actually working out. <laughs> yeah, I talk about on this podcast quite a bit. Like, I feel like I'm actually a hunter now. You know, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'm not just a dude out there trying yeah. to learn how to hunt. I feel like yeah. I, you know, obviously, will I doubt I'll ever know it all. But the point I want to know it all. <laughs> I, yeah, I you're not. The, you're a yeah. You're definitely becoming a hunter versus just a glorified camo nature walker. Right, exactly. <laughs> I love it. All right, so we've gotten into this podcast kind of kind of a little bit. Tell the listeners who you are, where you're from, and all that. And, and like, tell, also, why is hunting so special to you? Yeah, so I'm from, uh, I'm from central Washington, a small town called Wenatchee. Um, graduated, joined the Marines, left. I was in the Marines for eight years. Uh, didn't really hunt much. I hunted growing up with my dad and stuff, ducks and deer. And then when I joined the military, it was, you know, I was so busy. I deployed a lot and, um, I, I was able to get back a couple, a couple of hunting seasons throughout that career. But once I got out, I was, I wasn't into it. Uh, I was kind of just dealing with some stuff and eventually, uh, eventually my dad kind of like borderline strong armed me into, hunting again. Like you're, you're, let's go. We're going, you know, we're going deer hunting this, this season you're going. And it was just so nice to unplug from everything, you know, no cell service, quiet in the nature. And it was just something that was so good for me that it kind of became, it took over its own addiction, you know, and sorry, I've got my dogs going crazy. Um, (laughs) no worries. The, uh, but yeah, it just became such an addiction. And then I got linked up with a nonprofit uh, based out of Seattle called The Fallen Outdoors. And it was just vets getting together with other vets hunting. And, you know, it was super, super fun. I met, you know, some really great people. And it kind of just kept the jump start of this is something I wanted to do as far as guiding, which I mean, I guided for a few outfitters and stuff. But it, you know, it kind of was my passion project was you know, getting guys who, you know, were dealing with the stressors of, you know, transitioning out of the military, uh, get them out, get them, you know, get them in the, in the wild. And it's, you know, I mean, I'm a big, a big proponent of, you know, the idea of wilderness therapy, which I really do feel like, I mean, that fresh air and that quiet is super healing for the soul. Oh yeah. You know? And, uh, so that, that was where, I ended up inevitably linking up with, um, my current partner, Ryan, and, um, we were doing vet hunts and passion projects, uh, around the country. He, he was doing it, I was doing it. And we just kind of linked up and linked up with a third gentleman, Rob Anthony, who started High Point Adventures. Um, they're a 501c3 nonprofit now out of Colorado. And him and Ryan actually met through Rob doing a Purple Heart uh, mountain lion hunt. Rob's a houndsman, so he runs his hounds. Sweet. And yeah, it kind of all just has slowly been a really organic growth where, you know, me and Ryan run run the hunts all around the country. And Rob, with just his heart of service, is just there doing anything and everything to support us in, you know, this adventure. And I mean, it's been really awesome. And we've done, you know, fully guided Sandhill Crane with some awesome outfitters in Texas. Um, we've done bear hunts up in Wisconsin. We've got some really awesome sea duck hunts coming up, um, on the coast of Maine, upstate New York, and then off the coast of Washington this year. So, I mean, those are outfitters that are donating their time lodges that are donating. And, you know, we go through and we find the vets and bring them out. And it's, you know, usually we, we try to tailor it to people that have never done this sort of activity. So, you know, sea duck hunting, if you, you know, if you grow up sea duck hunting, we, we, we tend to pick guys who are probably never going to have a chance to do this again. Yeah. You know, I am a huge proponent and, and I always preach about on this podcast, you can't outgive good. When you put good out into the world, you don't do it because of what you're going to get back, but it's just a natural flow of things. The yin and yang, just that circular 
part of life where what you put out is, is what you get back in return. And so it's so awesome to hear that you are, well, you're, you're dedicated towards the healing part of hunting and also just know, you know how powerful hunting can be. And so you're, you're trying to provide this opportunity for veterans and people that have served this country with pride and really given the ultimate sacrifice. I, I seriously commend you, and it's so cool that you're you're doing this. One of the things I, I have a question for, and I've always because I do my own mentored hunts, where we're we're taking people out, we're getting them involved, we're showing them how to to dive deeper into hunting, you know, shorten learning curve and remove barriers as much as possible. When you're dealing with veterans, uh, potentially like wounded or you know, terminally ill or whatever it is. What's your selection process to get these guys involved? Because I just got done watching and seeing what Jana Waller did with Skullbound TV, and she's a huge proponent of getting uh, wounded warriors out hunting. She took this dude out without legs, like he had no yeah. lower body. Uh, yeah, I was I saw that on Bam's page, um, and I think a lot of that too is I mean Bam's nonprofit's amazing. Wishes for Warriors, they're big, big, you know, and he's doing awesome things and he's such a character as well. Um, a lot of it is, so we'll get an outfitter that comes to us and says, all right, I want to do. So let's say for instance, uh, we've got an outfitter that wants to do a hog hunt for four vets. And then, so me and Ryan will sit there and we'll work with the outfitter. Okay. What are, is this spot in stock? Is this sitting in blinds? Are they elevated blinds? You know, so then we'll, know what uh the capabilities of the vets that we need to find are um there's other hunts we have rob has a there's a we have a vet going out for a deer tag late season deer tag in colorado that was a landowner donated the tag and it's i mean this is gonna be a giant buck this guy takes but it's not a hard hunt so we at that we find mobility impaired um you know has a hard time somebody that maybe can't walk and hike all day somebody that's more comfortable with okay if we we're going to drive you know we're going to drive you in the truck and then you'll get out and shoot or you know i mean the the hunt can be as hard as uh as it needs to be or as simple as it needs to be um but so yeah we kind of once the outfitter and once we kind of identify okay this is the hunt this is the caliber of somebody we need to be taking so we, you know, and then from there, we'll, we have them submit, uh, when they submit for a hunt, they send a redacted, uh, service. It's called the DD-214. It's their discharge paperwork that states that they were honorably discharged. And so that's just for our records. And then we have them typically write a page. What are they able to do? You know, what are some of their limitations? Why they want to do these hunts, you know, and stuff like that. And then we, we sift through and we read every single one. And from there, we kind of break it down to, okay, this is, we need to, let's call these guys and let's talk to them on the phone. Let's, you know, and we, so we do our due diligence as far as putting, trying to get the right guys or or gals on these hunts. That's so cool. What, um, what, for anyone who's listening to this podcast that has either their would fall under this category or they have a relative or they have a friend or whatever that knows someone that this would be a great fit for them, how would they go to, to get involved or get signed up or potentially um, be a part of what you're doing? Yeah. So a lot of, I mean, we don't, we we're building, currently building the website up. So that'll be one way to submit once we have that all done. Obviously that's a slower process. Um, we have our Facebook page, High Point Adventures, and we announce a lot of the trips there, but also on my Instagram and Facebook pages, um, which are at high range hunting for both of them. We announce them there. And then Ryan also announces them on his social media, which is, uh, Ryan off the grid. And so from there we post the whole, this, you know, this is the who, what, when, where, why, this is what we're looking for submit to. And we, you know, we'll put the, the email to send the documents to, and then me and him, once we have you know, it's been a week or two, three weeks. We'll close it down and we'll start sifting through the names and reading, reading the stories and stuff. Yeah, man, it is. 
it can be overwhelming sometimes. There's so many people that you want to give to and you want to support and you want to make sure that they get taken care of. And yet, you know, you and Ryan are just you, you and Ryan and, you know, my buddies and my, my group washing backcountry, we, we can only do so much, especially with the fact that, you know, I also want to hunt as well as, you know, fill my tags as well as help other people. So it's totally, it, you know, this is where hunting is a selfish thing, but there's no greater thing that you can do than to be selfless and to make sure that, you know, you're, you're supporting other people. Yeah. And that was, I mean, the big thing is with Brian, especially Ryan, he's taken, I mean, he, I, I think prior to, we went down to Texas and did, he, uh, we went down and met with an outfitter and kind of were locking on some, uh, deals with a ranch down in Texas. But he, when we were down there, he hasn't pulled the trigger on an animal in probably five or six years because he's just, you know, putting all these hunts together. And then he goes and films them that, you know, it just takes away from his trigger time. So it was really cool for me, you know, to him finally have somebody who he could be the hunter and I could film and document his hunt. So that was a lot of fun. He got that bison. Um, yeah, I, this, I definitely this watched year. that on your YouTube channel. That was fun. Yeah. And it was, it was a lot of fun and it was cool, you know, to just want, you know, obviously we were, you know, put down this partnership with this, with this outfitter and a ranch. And then on top of that, you know, did a hunt with them and stuff. And it was, it was just a lot of fun to kind of, you know, he, he does, he does a lot, you know, more than, more than a lot of people that I know does for vets and it takes away, it was fun to see him kind of actually get behind a gun for once instead of behind a camera. Yeah. That's so cool. I love it. So talk a little bit, let's switch gears here. Talk about your very first archery elk this year. Dude, tell, tell the listeners, I want to hear this story and I, uh, you know, every story, even how it's shared can always help another hunter through a circumstance. So tell us about it. All right. So this hunt was something actually my uncle and my dad, you know, we've always, we've hunted the North, uh, the panhandle of Idaho. It's an, you know, easy over the counter tag and they wanted to explore South. And so they looked at a unit that was called in Idaho. It's a capped quota unit. So they only give out a certain amount. It's an over the counter, but it's first come first serve with a certain amount of tags for that unit. So we, got in touch with an outfitter. We wanted to do a drop camp horseback in dropped off left, you know, away from people. And the hardest thing was going to be securing the tags. And so it came down to at 10 o'clock on this day, the tags would go public and you had to be Johnny on the spot. And all of us were there. There was five of us total that were going to go in this group. And I'm the only one that got a tag. Wow. Yeah. And so, my uncle and his brother-in-laws, they backed out. And I told my dad, I said, look, it's, it's, it's a lot of money to have this outfitter take us in. I will go in solo. You do not need to go like this. A lot of money. You know, you don't even have a tag. And my dad was like, no, I'm doing it. Let's go. Let's do this. And so it turned out to just be me and my dad. And we worked with this outfitter all spring or all summer he was scouting and he was running his trail rides and stuff. And so he would drop a pin where we were going to be. So we could start our e-scouting and he would drop pins. Okay. Saw a big bull here, saw a bull here, saw a bull here. And so we were getting super pumped. And then the fires happened this, you know, early fall. Mm -hmm. And so we got, when we got to his, uh, we were driving up the Canyon. We were in the sawtooth wilderness area, uh, around that area down in central Idaho, just North of Boise. And we got down to the area and, uh, the fire had crossed over onto the ridge that we were going to be at a drop camp. And so all the e-scouting, he, the guide pretty much had to stand up another drop camp somewhere else last minute. And Mm -hmm. so we didn't have time to e-scout. We didn't have time to download maps. And what turned out to be like a two and a half mile trail ride in became a 14 and a half mile into a drop camp. (laughs) <laughs> and my legs were not prepared for being on a horse for six hours. <laughs> I was, I got off about six miles in. I started walking the horse, just towing it behind. Cause I just, I couldn't do it. My legs hurt. My knees hurt. I was just not prepared for being on a horse that long. And so when we finally got there, he leaves and we're in this just, I mean, it was beautiful. This awesome meadow, high mountains, you know, high canyons, everywhere. It was awesome. 
And so we started out and it was just, we were going to scout the first day and we spent the whole first day just scouting and we weren't hearing any bugles. So we, you know, we'd keep pushing farther and farther, rip a bugle. And then that evening we were getting out to go out for our evening hunt. And I looked up on the hillside, you know, about a mile and a quarter, you just barely see a tan body come out of the timber at the tip top. And it was like, we got the spotting scope out and identified that there was a bull up there. And it was one of those like, well, all right, how are we going to get up there? Let's make a plan. And as soon as we got everything ready to go, we were going to go after this bull. It started hailing and downpour. Just, it was like, well, mother nature says, nope, stay. You know, so we hung out at the camp, made a plan for the next day. And instead of going straight up, we decided we were going to go down the valley and up and around. And that way we could explore this lower. There were some burns and some wallows and meadows. We wanted to explore. We knew he was up there, but he wasn't bugling. He had some cows. And we did about an eight and a half mile hike that day and ran out of light. Couldn't even get back to him. We went, it was just so steep and thick, but we didn't see any animals, didn't see any elk, deer, nothing. It was just like kind of disheartening. And we got, so we got back to camp that night and we we're just kind of like, man, you know, didn't see him again. He didn't come out of the meadow, didn't hear a bugle. And I was like, good Lord, like, where's all, where's all the animals? Uh huh. And we decided that if we didn't see him that, so we sat out, we glassed all night on that one spot that he was at. And we're like, well, we didn't see him. Let's go up this valley today or tomorrow. So we got out and went up the valley and about 10 o'clock, a bugle rips out from up where he was at. And it was like, all right, let's go. And so we dropped all non-essential weight at the base of this mountain. We pin, dropped a pin. My dad left his bag. I carried my bag with a little bit, like a Nalgene full of water, my bow and the camera. And it was straight up just, I mean, some of the steepest hiking I've done. And it took us about three and a half hours to get up there. Um, and we, I mean, we were smoked at that point. It was hot. There were shale slides that we were calling, you know, it was one of those, man, it, I don't, at this point, I don't care if this is a spike, a cow, <laughs> there is an elk up here. I'm shooting it because I have just busted my tail to get up here. Right. <laughs> and we got, we got going and my dad was filming and we got into a position where we thought, okay, he's got to be one ridge over. We're about parallel with this hill. And I rip a cow call really quick. And that bull was 50 yards away. And so it was like no time to get the camera out, you know, no time for anything. He bugles, walks about 30 yards, starts raking the ground. And I'm, he has, you know, I'm hidden and he gets behind a tree about 18 yards in front of me and bugles again. And I'm like, shoot. So I look behind me, rip one cow call just into the wind. So it pulls the sound. And, uh, he didn't, he stepped out from that tree. I was already at full draw right in the bread basket. And as soon as, as soon as my dad heard the thud of the arrow, we both started cow calling and that bull stopped right in, I mean, nine yards stopped and just kind of was looking at us. And it was, I mean, if you ever watch the video, it's super funny because my dad didn't have his camera, but he pulls his cell phone out. Right when I shoot, he drops his cell phone. So then you see the cell phone hit the ground. He picks it back up as this bull kind of trots off. And you, you could tell, I mean, I, I could see just, just the fletch or the, the knock sticking out. I uh -huh. mean, it was buried in him. It didn't, nope, didn't pass through, just probably hit a uh, rib on the other side. And he walked back slowly. I almost put another shot in him, but it was one of those, you could see him starting to wobble and he walked right back to where he bugled from laid down and was, I heard him thrash once half hour. We, you know, we gave him a little bit of time just to kind of let everything calm down. Wow. Got over there and he was just right there. And it was, uh, it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. It was, you know, the, the reward for that hard work. And then we realized, okay, we got, let's get him, let's get him quartered up, get the meat hanging. And that's when we realized that some of that non-essential weight was game bags. Ah. My dad's bag at the bottom of the hill. And so it's about one thirty, two o'clock 
and we kind of made the decision that it was either we've got him out, go down and we come back tomorrow morning or my dad makes the trek down, grabs the game bags, gets some headlamps and comes back up while I quarter out the bowl. Mm. And so that was kind of, okay, let's do it. Well, so I got the bowl all quartered out. I mean, I'm, ex- I was exhausted, you know, dehydrated. It's just emotionally, I was like, I hit that high. And then I was at that low where it was just like, I'm so tired, you know, <laughs> and the sun started going down and my dad started returned. And I was like, oh man, what, you know, what is going on? So every hour from about six o'clock till dark, I would uh, half hour to an hour, I would go down to this, the ridge top and just, we have a, we have a call that we kind of do. It was my grandfather's call where he just, woo, you know, almost like an owl, like a really high pitched owl, as loud as you can. Cause it, it, that sound really carries. And I would do it every half hour and no response, no response. Sun goes down. It's starting to get windy. I'm in a t-shirt and light hunting pants and that's it on the top of this hill. It's dark. It's like 10 o'clock and I'm cold at this point. I'm, I mean, I'm cold. I had nothing up there. And I was like, my dad will come back. I know he'll be back, but it was like, I had to tuck in and just fetal position next to the bull just for heat. And I was breathing, inhaling in my nose, exhaling into my shirt just to get some body heat. (laughs) And, uh, eventually I hear voices above me. Uh, I knew the trail, the horse trail that we rode in on was about 400 yards above me. Yeah. And I started hearing like conversation voice. And so I kind of was laying there just trying not to move. And I heard, uh, I, I heard my dad do the who, and I was like, okay, why is he above me? He must've gone too far or something. And, uh, he gets down to me and it's, he's like that. There was no way we were getting down that at dark in the dark, even with headlamps. It was so steep. He goes, the safest thing to do was I went back to camp. I got you a jacket and a sweatshirt and your beanie and I brought a tarp and we're going to sleep up on the hill tonight. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, all right, let's, you know, let's do it. So he brought me, I have like, I have this cryptic, like a down puffy jacket. And it was that we set up the, the, the mountain ambush tarp, set it up with the, the uh, trekking poles. And it was one of those, like, let's just, we'll ride it out till sunrise. And that was a long cold miserable night is your dad former military as well no he's just a savage (laughs) sounds like it (laughs) he's just like i mean and realistically like he was so i mean so he went down the straight down the hill and went instead of coming straight back up it he went the horse trail which was about two and a half or three miles of that gradual uphill around this valley so i mean he that i mean he probably put six miles on just to get back up. And he, I mean, he's just a savage. And so we spent the night spooning each other under this tarp <laughs> and Oh, it's hilarious. I mean, the next morning I get up and I'm like, you know, I had my cell phone out and I was like, how you feeling? And he his, the only thing he could say was he felt violated because it was just me and him spooning all night on the side of the hill where you could see where we dig our heels in, you know, just to, so we won't slide down. Kept, yep. We kept sliding down. And yeah, we got up, but he, the conversation I heard was he got on the sat phone and called the outfitter and said, Hey, we got to bowl down. And, uh, the outfitter was like, okay, I've got a client I got to take in in the morning, but I will come tomorrow at some point, just meet me at the camp. So we got the meat hung that, you know, hung in the tree and we hiked out and got back to our camp and we're, you know, we, we didn't know if the outfitter was going to make it in at what time. So it was like, well, we'll just chill by camp and, you know, have a, have a cocktail and soak our feet. And the minute we got back to camp, I got my boots off and there's the outfitter. I was like, oh, no, no rest. Just, all right, let's load up camp, get on the horses and ride back up and pack that out. (laughs) Yeah. So it was just, I mean, it was such a great, it was such a amazingly crazy experience. And then for my dad to be there, it was so much fun for that. Dude, that's special. That is, that's a pretty epic story, man. That's, uh, that's going to be hard to top those nights. When when hunters talk about the suck, it, it's no joke. Like, but the suck is what makes the story so awesome. That's exactly it. It's like every time I eat that elk, I'm like, I remember that night. <laughs> like, 
God. Yeah, the very first bear, the, the first big game animal that kicked it all off was a bear that I packed out solo, cape and all, the rug, all in one trip. Like, I, <laughs> oh, dude, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I, I remember eating it. I'm like, you guys better not waste a single ounce or a bite of this meat because I know what it took to get it out of the mountains. And, you know, it just made it that much more special. Exactly. So, yeah. like, I love like, it. No, that's, and that's exactly like, what's funny is like, I mean, I've had, I've had, you know, animals where it's like, oh, you know, I shot like last year, I shot my mule deer 42 minutes after shooting light. Wasn't, wasn't a great story. I was like, man, all these guys get these cool stories. I never get a good story. Finally got my good story. You got your story. I love it. So what is on the docket coming up? So you, you obviously are going to be doing uh, some some give back hunts. Like, what are charity hunts? Is that what you call it? What do you, what do you call uh, it? We just, we just call them our vet hunts. Vet, veteran hunts. I love it. Yeah. Um, what do you got going on? So this is about to be super busy. Um, I've got, I head to the coast of Maine, uh, the second week of November for five days. We're bringing six guys out there and then me and Ryan are heading out to film it. Um, I get back from Maine and the first week of December, myself and a buddy are flying to Texas and we're, you know, just kind of a camaraderie hunt with me and him. He's a vet as well. Um, so we're going down and we're going to, you know, chase odd ad access whitetail, uh, down in Southern Texas. And then I fly back from Texas and that weekend we have sea ducks off the coast of Maine. We have two vets coming up for that. And then Christmas and over New Year's Eve, we're taking four guys to upstate New York to do uh, diver and diver ducks on Lake Ontario or one of the Great Lakes. Dude. Yeah. And then, and then in between that, whenever I'm home, I'll be taking guys out, you know, in my local neighborhood, just doing, you know, ducks here. And then I've got, hopefully, I mean, if they're, you know, time willing, uh, over the Thanksgiving break, I'm going to try to take my dad out and get him his elk. I've got a Washington elk tag and we both have deer tags still that we haven't. Ooh, so busy man. Yeah. Busy yeah. man. And then, yeah. And we, I mean, we just got back from Wyoming. I took my dad out to Wyoming. We did antelope last week. So it's, it, it, it actually is kind of nice to be home and like sitting here on a couch, relaxing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Chris, tell all the listeners where they can go to find all of your content that you're delivering and how to connect with you. Yeah. So Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube is all high range hunting. Uh, videos are up there. Uh, Instagram, we do Instagram and Facebook is where we announce a lot of our vet trips and, and stuff like that. And then we're always, I mean, we're always looking for donations. If anybody wants to get involved, um, that's, uh, we have a PayPal set up until the website gets done and everything, but we've got our PayPal for high point adventures, uh, through Instagram. It's, I believe it's high point underscore adventures. And the link is in the description there. And well, I'll make sure to add that in the show notes as well. Cool. So everyone can get a hold of that and, and, uh, dude, give back. I love it. Yeah, man. So, so one thing I want to ask you, and you kind of touched on this earlier in the episode, but because this is a soulful hunter podcast, what is hunting done for your soul? Honestly, I think if I'd never got reintroduced back into hunting, I honestly don't know where I'd be today. Like that's, I mean, I was, I was not good after I transitioned out of the military. I was, you know, angry, lost, and just kind of just run down and, you know, and that it's just kind of re-energized my, I guess we'll call it a purpose. You know, it's given me something to look forward to giving back to someone else that may be in the situation that I was feeling eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Powerful, man. This is why everyone needs to experience hunting, whether they do Definitely. it once or they do it forever. The experience itself, you'll never forget. And it'll impact. Oh, your absolutely. Life. Yeah. So. And I mean, especially with, you know, there's, there's awesome mentor programs now, you know, I know you guys do a lot of it, but especially with fish and game, actually acknowledging mentorship now and, you know, waiving hunter's education. If you're going 
you know, with a mentor hunter, there's all kind of, there's no reason somebody doesn't just say, I want to check it out. Let's go do this. Dude, I'm a huge proponent and I just did it, uh, advertised it, did a post on it, social media this week is like, you can get your hunter safety classes and your trappers education classes. And I think archery class as well. Everything is online. People need to yeah. capitalize on it. Send the link, get on it on your phone and literally send a link to your friends, to your coworkers, to your community, whatever it is, and be like, hey, take this test right now. You can do it yeah. while you're on the toilet, Sitting on, on the couch, yeah, you on can, the, you, you can I do mean, it while whatever. you're pretending to do school. R- right, exactly. Because it, this is the time to capitalize on it. My wife, she just completed her under safety. I'm going to take her out next year. My hunting buddy, Tony, I texted him the link to hunter safety, and he took it while he was at work and completed it. And now look at what we're doing. I mean, exactly. it, it literally where everyone is a text message away and you yeah. want to get more people involved and you want to help people and heal people and then just give them the opportunity. A lot of people are too lazy. You know, society, they want to be spoon fed, right? You know, the instant yeah. gratification. Hey. Give, give me now. Give mm. me now. Well, if you can at least give somebody the link to Hunter's education or Trapper's education or whatever. Dude, you've done your part at least. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just want to say one last thing before we wrap this bad boy up. On social media, I've been doing this hashtag Patriots in the Wild and really encouraging everyone to always carry an American flag with them when they're out out of field so that they can take a picture of themselves and show their American pride and their patriotism, whether it's with a downed animal or just on the highest peak or out in the darkest, deepest forest or whatever. And since you are doing so much work with veterans and you are a veteran yourself, I want to encourage you and all the listeners to make sure that bring an American flag with you and start taking pictures with our with that flag and, and use the hashtag Patriots in the Wild. And let's promote America. Let's promote hunting. Let's promote the love for what we have for this land, these animals, and the pastime in which we're doing. Okay. I will... I will answer your call, my dude. I will take on these next three vet hunts. I will take a photo with the vets that we're taking out. That's what I'm talking about, man. And then tell them, be okay. like, hey, next time you guys get out, don't forget this. You know, let let that fire spread just organically and naturally. I love it. Dude, Perfect. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for sharing your stories and uh, everything you got going on over at High Range Hunting. Listeners, don't forget to go check out all of his great content. And if you know anyone, whether it's a veteran, someone's terminally ill, law enforcement, whatever it is that you think could really be impacted from going hunting, reach out to Chris at High Range Hunting. Get involved. Get him, get him uh, all the information you need to, to have somebody get healed and experience what nature has. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Johnny Mack. Freedom on and stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful. 